Before the invention of anaesthetic, surgery had to be done whilst the patient was fully conscious and could feel everything. Those that opted to go under the knife had to be forcibly restrained, and procedures were more often like a fight than an operation. The whole situation was horrific for everyone involved, and a solution had to be sought to give patients much-needed pain relief. One man didn't believe substances were the logical step, but he discovered a new solution that was free. He believed pain relief was all in the mind. But was his theory correct, or an elaborate hoax? Today on Macabre London, we'll be uncovering the story of Dr John Elliotson and the malpractice of mesmerism. Welcome back to another episode of Macabre London. I'm Nikki Drews, your host with a silent G, and today I'll be taking you on a journey down another of London's grimy backstreets to uncover a macabre tale from the city's past. However, before we get into today's episode, if you are new here and you want to see more videos where we deep dive into some lesser known historic tales from London and in fact all over the world, then please don't forget to subscribe so you never miss a new episode. Also, a bit of a warning in case you'd not already guessed, today's episode starts off gory. So if you're a little squeamish, maybe skip the intro or listen to another episode entirely. Europe in the late 1700s was awash with interesting medical practices. Things which you would assume would have been ruled out by the medieval times were still being pursued and science was at its experimental peak. During the Age of Enlightenment, as it's come to be known, Doctors were trying out all manner of interesting treatments, some which were very successful, standing the test of time, such as leeches and maggots to clean wounds, but others which had long-lasting negative effects, which were also regularly carried out, such as trepanning, which is boring a hole in your head to improve your blood balance. Other harmless but useless treatments ranged from drinking milk from the same bowl a ferret had drunk from to cure whooping cough, or using your own urine as mouthwash to fight cavities. Needless to say, it was an interesting time for doctors, but a terrifying one for patients. One thing doctors didn't have any effective treatment for was pain. Anyone unlucky enough to have to undergo surgery had to do so without anaesthetic, and there were no painkillers for the recovery period, meaning the whole affair was absolutely miserable for everyone involved. Surgeons needed the assistance of several people to restrain their patients as they inevitably tried to escape their procedures, which made everything excessively violent and traumatic. Those who wanted to try to numb the pain in advance would drink copious amounts of alcohol beforehand, which would lead to profuse bleeding, as booze is a blood thinner. Those that managed to not go into shock were subject to immense amounts of pain, and surgeons were trained to be as kind as possible to patients. However, when surgery without anaesthetic was the only option, the need for speed was the main decider on whether a patient lived or died. The faster the surgery, the less pain and blood loss occurred. Perhaps the worst part of the whole affair was that wounds had to be cauterised to stop people dying from blood loss, meaning open wounds were dunked in hot tar or burnt with a red-hot iron, which if patients hadn't passed out by that point, made things even more excruciatingly painful. And that's just the brutality of the procedure. The healing process was the hardest part. Due to unsterilised instruments used during surgery and a lack of understanding about bacteria, people often suffered from gangrene or infections and died from sepsis or other complications. You may at least feel some comfort knowing you were in the hands of a consummate professional, However, the majority of surgeries were carried out by barbers and not physicians. And yes, you did hear that correctly. You could go in for a short back and sides and leave missing an arm. Barber surgeons were the people you would go to for 
all manner of treatments. In fact, the striped pole, which is still used to advertise a barbershop, shows off the treatments they had on offer. The red and white stripes are representative of the bloodletting and bandages that were once a commonplace treatment, alongside other more traditional beautifications like haircuts and shaving. In a time before bathroom facilities at home were commonplace, you could also go to the barbers to be bathed. If you needed a tooth pulled, they also did dentistry, and if you were feeling a little bunged up, they could also provide you with an enema. In fact, enemas were very commonplace back in the day, so much so that some people became addicted to them, having them a few times a week. Barber surgeons were a means to an end, a one-stop shop for all your bodily requirements, but it was clear to physicians and scientists that the time of offering cheap but deadly surgeries needed to come to a close. The options available had to change and advancements needed to be made. One of the first things on the agenda was to be able to offer pain relief. If patients could be unconscious without having to be knocked out physically or filled to the gills with alcohol, this would make surgeries at least a little bit easier for everyone involved. Experiments started with substances which could incapacitate patients, but quite often this didn't go well, and it was difficult to administer a dose which didn't harm the consumer or, worse, cause them to wake up halfway through surgery. Other methods which had little to no side effects were preferable, and physicians were always looking for a safe alternative. But the experiments took years to perfect, and many people suffered as a result. Apart from the numerous obvious problems of operating on a patient which is still fully conscious, the surgeons themselves had to be as quick as possible. This didn't afford them time to study the inner machinations of the body, and meant that surgery wasn't the learning opportunity it could be. In order to advance medicine, the problem of pain relief had to be solved and many eminent physicians took a stab at trying different techniques, but to no avail. However, a visiting Irish chemist, Richard Chenevie, who stopped by London in 1828 to give a series of lectures, showed off a new technique of mesmerism, which seemingly put patients under a spell, causing them to feel little to no pain. Amongst those in the audience of eminent physicians that day was Dr. John Elliotson. Elliotson was already interested in phrenology, the science of reading people's skulls, which has since been proved as bunkum, and he originally went to see Richard talk about that particular subject. When he began to mention mesmerism, Elliotson thought he may be onto something. However, it seemed that Elliotson became distracted and focused on other newfangled treatments such as acupuncture, being one of the first doctors to use it in practice in the UK, and also the merits of cupping, where skin is pulled upwards under a vacuum of a hot small glass bowl, which is said to clean stagnant blood, both of which are generally thought to not really do very much nowadays. It wouldn't be until nine years later that he would come back to the benefits of mesmerism. John Elliotson was born on October the 29th, 1791, in Southwark, in central London. The son of a chemist, John was always fascinated by all things medical, and so it was no surprise when he expressed an interest in going to medical school in the most prestigious place for medicine at the time, the University of Edinburgh, in Scotland. Elliotson was a slave to knowledge, and he was never content unless he was learning, securing himself two degrees, one at the aforementioned Edinburgh, and another at the snappily titled The College of the Blessed Virgin Mary, St John the Evangelist, and the Glorious Virgin St Radigand, near Cambridge. Today, it's just called Jesus College, and it's part of the University of Cambridge. With two degrees secured, Elliotson was more than qualified to teach, and so he taught at both major London hospitals, St Thomas's and Guy's. John was a breath of fresh air in the medical world, Firstly, he was physically not like others in his field. He was five foot tall with jet black hair and an unusually large head. He dressed in the latest fashions instead of other more traditional garms that doctors wore to practice, which made him stand out. His lectures were also much more animated than his peers and his eccentric style of teaching brought in many students and spectators, inspiring many young men to go into the field of medicine. 
Elliotson was willing to be experimental and open to many theories, some of which he was right about, such as the production of the stethoscope which allowed doctors to listen to their patients' hearts and lungs. He carried this enthusiasm into his private practice in the West End, but many people commented that he was better as a teacher than as a practising physician. His tendency to be flamboyant and enthusiastic earned him a reputation for his diagnostic work being exemplary, but his treatment methods ineffectual or overzealous. Always keen to learn the next new thing and stay ahead of the zeitgeist, John still attended regular lectures, and it was at one of these lectures his memory was jogged about mesmerism. And I bet John would have been really pleased if he'd had some special elixir to help him focus during these lectures. I'd just like to take a moment to tell you about something which has been helping me with my writing and my overall focus recently. And you know them, you love them, and if you don't, you need to get involved. It's Magic Mind. Now, I wouldn't say I'm a coffee addict, but I'm more of a coffee regularist. It's a new word I've just made up, but you know what it means. I'm not sold on the effects of coffee as it makes me a little bit jittery and makes my focus pretty bad, which is no good for writing my episodes as I can't get into the flow state I need, but after drinking a shot of Magic Mind in the morning, I can honestly say it makes the world of difference. I can get things done in a fraction of the time they would take me before as I simply just get on with it instead of faffing around, and I 100% attribute that to Magic Mind. I've always struggled with my writing and staying focused, but after using these little green shots for just a few days, I saw a huge improvement in my ability to focus, and more importantly, stay focused. Now you know this if you've been around for a while now, but on the show I often have to rake over very dry and difficult to read documents, panning for the gold which makes it into the episodes, but it can be a very tiresome process and it's easy to get distracted, but Magic Mind gives you that direct focus you need to get through it. When I've had a shot of Magic Mind in the morning, about an hour before I start my script writing, I really find it helps me just breeze through the boring bits and to retain the info I need to create my episode, which caffeine was only really hindering me with before. The little shots, which are so cute and dinky, have a balance of nootropics and adaptogens inside, including lion's mane and cordyceps mushrooms, which are proven to help with clarity and focus, along with a nice helping of green tea. What I do with my magic mind is just mix it into a latte with a little bit of extra agave to give it some more sweetness. In fact, I had an iced one this morning and it was delicious. If you're short on time, you can also just take it as a shot and the size of the packaging makes it really easy to just pop it in your bag and take it with you. I would never recommend anything that I don't actually like myself, so you're safe in the knowledge that this is an excellent way to start your mornings and I honestly feel this has really helped me to be able to concentrate better for longer and to contribute to bringing you the episode that you're currently listening to. If you're interested in trying Magic Mind for yourself, then you can get a whopping 40% off a subscription or 20% off your first one-time purchase by visiting the Magic Mind website at www.magicmind.co forward slash macabre and using my offer code macab 20 The 40% off code is only valid for 10 days, so if you want to get that 40% off and to try it for yourself to start on your better focus journey, then you'll have to be quick. That's www.magicmind.co forward slash macabre and use my offer code macab 20 That's M-A-C-A-B-R-E and the numbers 2 and 0. Thanks very much for listening and back to the episode. Always keen to learn the next new thing and stay ahead of the zeitgeist, John still attended regular lectures and it was at one of these lectures his memory was jogged about mesmerism. Baron Jules Denis du Potay, an esotericist from France, came to London to demonstrate his talent for mesmerism. Considered to be one of the best in his field, Jules put on shows which demonstrated his ability to control people, and Elliotson was hooked. Jules was missing a thumb, and it was this missing digit that many attributed his mesmeric skills to. He was so well respected in France that his mesmerism was even used to solve crimes, with one criminal being questioned whilst in an induced mesmeric state, and the police convicting the man after his confessions. Jules had developed his own style of mesmerism, but ultimately he had distilled it from its inventor, Franz Mesmer. Mesmer believed that inside humans, 
were magnets, which he referred to as animal magnetism. These magnets could be manipulated by others using their own magnetised bodies, and this would allow complete control of their physical and mental state. Mesmer used to put on displays and shows and taught people his techniques. These then got passed down throughout various schools of thought and found their way into the medical sphere. Elliotson, when observing the Baron performing his mesmerism show, decided the trance-like state he put people into was worth sharing with his colleagues and could be helpful for pain relief, so he asked Jules to teach him how to mesmerise his patients. Elliotson, now enthused with his newfound skills and confident in the Baron's work, decided to invite him to show his techniques at the hospital he worked at, the University College Hospital. His peers were intrigued and impressed at what they saw, and believed there was some merit to trying out mesmerism in a clinical setting. Over the next few months, Elliotson honed his craft, trying out his techniques on many patients, and word got out about this new technique, which seemingly helped with a variety of ailments, but also delivered pain relief. As word spread, the man who had his fingers in all the pies in Victorian London, Charles Dickens, heard about the frenzy Elliotson was delivering, and decided to go and see him perform his techniques for himself. Dickens was taken in by the practice, and after observing the takeover of others' minds, he was fascinated in the art of learning the skill for himself. He approached Elliotson and asked if he would teach him the art, and the two became great friends. Dickens practised his new trick on his wife Catherine, with some success, and so he began to spread the word of Elliot's and skills around town. With Dickens singing his praises, Elliotson became a household name, and people would come from far and wide to see him mesmerise people at UCH. Being already a bit of a showman, this sudden interest in his abilities meant that John began seeing which patients at UCH were most susceptible to mesmerism, and would therefore put on the best performance. Elizabeth Oakey was a patient at UCH, being treated for fits and convulsions, which nowadays we would recognise as epilepsy. Elizabeth was a shy and retiring girl who was usually calm and unassuming, but as soon as John put her under his spell, she was anything but that. Elliotson asked Elizabeth if she would be happy to show those visiting the hospital with some demonstrations upon her, and she agreed to appear in front of multiple audiences to show off his mesmeric prowess. To begin with, the shows were simple demonstrations, but over time they became more and more freak show-esque. He would invite those in attendance to do things to Elizabeth which would usually elicit a major response, such as pulling her hair, pinching her, or shoving snuff up her nose. Whilst under the influence of mesmerism, Elizabeth didn't respond to any of these stimuli. John also commanded Elizabeth to sing songs, swear like a sailor, and dance around at his command. On one occasion, Elliotson shoved a large needle with silk attached to it into Elizabeth's neck, without her flinching or making a noise. Elizabeth also had a sister at the hospital, Jane, and she wasn't spared from the public spectacle of being displayed on stage by Elliotson either. A number of other patients in the ward were also put under Elliotson's spell, but the results were mixed. However, Jane and Elizabeth were his best patients, as they both performed wonderfully. As the shows were getting more and more extravagant, more and more people started to visit the hospital to see the two sisters under Elliotson's spell. In this interim, Elliotson also performed his mesmerism on patients, about to go under the knife, with mixed results. John's equal at the school, Robert Liston, was all too aware that what Elliotson was spouting was not effective. Liston was known as the fastest surgeon around, with his fastest time for amputating a leg was just 25 seconds. He too was in search of a pain relief method which may help him to be able to deliver his surgery in a slower fashion, so he could perform his treatments with the advantage of time. Liston tried operating on some of John's mesmerised patients, and funnily enough, it turns out that mesmerism doesn't really help when you're having your leg chopped off. The sheer number of people who were now turning up to the hospital to see the Oakey twins was far too many to be accommodated within the confines of the wards, 
and Liston put an end to the show element of the displays as the trio were interfering with daily operations and affecting the patients. In fact, Liston had the hospital split into two, and their respective wards separated, so he could do what he deemed as his actual work, and Elliotson could mess about with whatever mumbo-jumbo he was up to in his half. As the shows were becoming more and more ridiculous, and the Oki sisters now adding clairvoyance to their roster of tricks, Thomas Wakeley, the owner of The Lancet, the top medical journal, who was also a good friend of Elliotson's, went to go and see one of these crazed performances. Wakeley was sceptical of what he observed, and deemed there may be some trickery involved by the girls. After this, disappointed in his friend who had seemingly gone from revered physician to a sellout showman, he decided to distance himself from Elliotson, despite having been originally a big proponent of mesmerism. However, Wakeley couldn't settle with his decision to ditch his friend, and so he instead thought he would secretly test the Oki sisters, to see if what he assumed about them being frauds was correct. Wakeley asked someone to mesmerise some water for him, and he asked the 15 and 17 year old girls to identify which receptacles were mesmerised or normal. The girls couldn't consistently identify the mesmerised water. From what was demonstrated by the girls to Wakeley, it seemed the sisters were faking, and Elliotson was drawn in by their hijinks. It was safe to say the pair's friendship was now well and truly over, and Wakeley went straight to the hospital with his findings. Soon after, John was publicly outed as a phony, and then subsequently fired from his position at UCH, much to Robert Liston's delight. Not content with getting him fired, Wakeley was so upset at John that he published not one, but two expose pamphlets to alert everyone to what Elliotson had been up to. After Elliotson's reputation had been splashed to the four winds, instead of dispensing with mesmerism, he leaned into it. He started a magazine called The Zoist, which celebrated all things phrenology and mesmerism, and continued to peruse the merits of the process. Continuing to double down, he created the London Mesmeric Infirmary, which had a focus on offering treatment to those who couldn't afford procedures elsewhere. Elliotson delivered almost 2,000 surgeries with the assistance of his mesmerism, and continued to publish articles in his own magazine about their success and how he'd managed to eradicate pain from those involved. Over the next few years, advancements were being made in America with chemical anaesthesia, the help of ether and chloroform. In fact, the first person to use ether as an anaesthetic in the UK was none other than Elliotson's enemy, Robert Liston. After Liston performed the operation in which the patient was incapacitated using ether, he said, This Yankee Dodge beats mesmerism hollow. After the invention of the modern anaesthetic, mesmerism began to die a death, like many of its patients had previously and the days of trance-like pain relief were over. John continued his successful private practice, and in 1846 was invited to take the Harvian Oration, which was one of the highest honours of the medical profession at the time. When his peers found out Elliotson was set to deliver the speech, they boycotted the Royal College of Physicians, and Thomas Wakeley, John's old friend turned nemesis, decided he would once again slander him in the Lancet magazine. At the speech, Elliotson was booed, but he graciously stood his ground, and despite knowing the topic of mesmerism would be frowned upon, he still decided to deliver his speech with that as his main focus. He said, Never forget these things, nor allow authority, conceit, habit, or the fear of ridicule to make us hostile to truth. We should always have before our eyes that memorable passage in Harvey's works. True philosophers, compelled by the love of truth and wisdom, never fancy themselves so wise and full of sense as not to yield to truth from any source and at all times. Nor are they so narrow-minded as to believe any art or science has been handed down in such a state of perfection to us by our predecessors that nothing remains for future industry. And with that... John's point was firmly on the table to his fellow physicians. Without experimentation, trial and error, 
there would be no future for medicine. For the remainder of his life, Elliotson continued practicing medicine from his private practice and continued to treat many people who were looking for alternative therapies. Today, he is often left off the list of eminent physicians of the Victorian era, as his theories weren't always correct. But as he said himself, there is no advancement without experimentation, and there was huge success in his failures. Perhaps it's best left to one of his patients, author William Makepeace Thackeray, to explain why John may have not been everyone's cup of tea, but to some, he was indispensable. In a letter he wrote to Elliotson, he said, My dear doctor, 13 months ago, when it seemed likely that this story had come to a close, a kind friend brought you to my bedside, whence in all probability I never should have risen but for your constant watchfulness and skill. I like to recall your great goodness and kindness, as well as many acts of others showing quite a surprising friendship and sympathy at that time when kindness and friendship were most needed and welcome. And as you would take no other fee but thanks, let me record them here in behalf of me and mine, and subscribe myself. Yours most sincerely and gratefully, W. M. Thackeray. Thackeray went on to dedicate his book, Pendennis, to Elliotson, as a symbol of his everlasting thanks. In a time when medicine was an emerging science, the physicians battling their way through it had a very tough job. Those that cared about their patients, more often than not, had to see their treatments fail and people pass away. But for every step they took in the right direction, which made the lives of others better, must have been exhilarating. So the next time you're at the doctors and they use a stethoscope, think of Elliotson. And if you ever have to have an anaesthetic, remember, this Yankee Dodge beats mesmerism hollow. Thanks for joining me for this episode. As always, I'd love to know your thoughts on this one, so leave me a comment and thumbs up on YouTube or a rating on your podcast provider. If you're new around here and you've not yet subscribed and you've made it to this point, then why not just hit that little subscribe button and the little notification bell and join the ghoul gang. We're a friendly bunch, so do come and join us. Also, if you do like the show and you'd like to support what I make, then why not consider becoming a patron like these amazing legendary executive Patreon producers, Amy, Barry, Christina, Jess, Kate, Kevin, Mary, Sam, Sarah and Veronica, and a huge thanks to all of our other patrons too. Patrons get an exclusive show from me once a month, you get to vote on what episodes I do next, and depending on the tier, you'll also get some tangible goodies through the post too. If you're not up for a long-term commitment and you'd just like to leave a tip, then there's my Amazon wishlist, which has items which help me make the show, and there's also one-off donation links in the description too, or you can use the ACAST supporter link at the beginning of the podcast. Now, I know I say this every time, but all of your support is absolutely vital for me being able to make this show. And also, I've now started editing the mini series that I've been telling you about, and it's looking really great. And I'm so excited for you to see it. It'll be coming out by the end of summer with any luck, but so far, I'll be really honest, it's cost me quite a bit to produce just on travelling alone, let alone all the other bits and bobs that go into producing a show like this. So I really need your help to make it good and to help me make the next section of it. So if you've got some spare pennies, I know things are tough at the moment, so please, only if you have spare pennies and you'd like to help me, then I would be eternally grateful. The series will premiere itself exclusively on Patreon to say thank you. So if you want to help me make that, you'll be added as an accredited producer to the credits. And thank you very much for even considering to join. Oh, and don't forget to check out Magic Mind. Please go and have a look at the bargain deal they're offering you. It honestly is a really good product. The link for it will be in the description. And all that leaves me to say is thanks for joining me for another macabre tale from London's past. I've been Nikki Druce, and I'll see you ghouls next time. Oh, in the next episode, my night will be back, will be back. I'm so excited.